What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Come Up series. We are Money Market Truth. My name is Mark. I'm with Uncultured Currency, as well as my political channel called Half Breed Observer. To my left this time is my co-host. Introduce hey yourself, sir. I'm Mo from OTB Clubhouse. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Make sure you got your notepads because today we have a special guest. We're not going to sit here and drag this out. It's not hot. Take Thursdays. We're thinking about renaming it, by the way. But we are going to have a guest today. We covered cash secure puts. We cover cover calls before. And we even had a guest come on. She talked about how she uses it to trade on a daily basis. Well, there's this... Um, this process called the wheel strategy, where you utilize both the cover calls and the cash secure puts. And I brought a guest on here who does this for a living. He has his own YouTube channel called TJ The Wheel Deal. Please go over there and support this brother. He's get him to at least a thousand subscribers. Please go over there and subscribe so this guy can get it monetized. He has good content. He's transparent. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome TJ. What's going on, TJ? How you doing? Hey, TJ. How's it going, guys? My name is TJ The Wheel Deal. Nice to see you guys. No, thank you for coming on, man. Thank you for coming on. So tell the audience a little bit about who you are real quick, and then let's get into what you do for a living. For sure. My name is TJ. I'm from Texas. I've uh, been in the market for about 25 years off and on, guys. But it wasn't the wheel deal right away. It was just buy, hold, and hope. Invest long and steady. Steady Eddie wins the race. I don't care what anybody says on YouTube. Remember this. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Steady Eddie wins the race. Just invest blindly into the market and you'll look up in 20 or 30 years, you're going to have a lot of money. You're not even going to know how you did it. That is the surefire way to make legit income in the market. Now, there's other strategies like myself. I sell puts and I sell calls for a living, collect a lot of premium. And we'll get into that, Mark. And that is ultimately what I do for a living now. But I did everything, man, from selling cell phone satellites to the oil field. And I just accumulated money along the way. And eventually I wanted to use that money to make me more money so that I could take control of my time. That was ultimately what I wanted to do. And the wheel strategy is kind of a set it and forget it strategy where you don't have to hypnotize the market. You don't have to look at the charts too heavily or anything of the sort. And that really, really appealed to me because I really value my time. I have my priorities in order. And uh, I'm trying to maintain a good work-life balance, good work-life balance, and the wheel strategy allows me to do that for sure. So, well, quick question for you though. So, just mm -hmm. uh, so the audience knows, this is what you do for a living now, right? You don't Facts. have, you don't have nine to five, nothing. No. This is what you just do now. Okay, for how long did it take you until you were able to completely quit your job and do this? So it was about 25 years of building, obviously, right? Because in order to trade the wheel strategy at the level that I do, you need seven figures. So it takes a while to get to those levels. So I don't sugarcoat anything for my audience. I got about 900 subscribers on my channel and I show them everything. You know, I show them the good, the bad, the ugly, and the indifferent. Uh, but when I went, when I decided to quit the oil field, that was in 2020, because uh, I had uh, something very personal happen. I lost my daughter. So I had to do an introspection and I was like, do I really want to devote 87.5 hours of my life to working or do I want to devote them to my God, my family, my friends, things that are way more important than just going out there and exchanging time for money? Because that's what it is when you have a nine to five or in my case, a six to six, right? 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. to 7 a.m., 6 a.m., depending on if uh, I'm working days or nights. So uh I decided to go full time with it when I felt like I had enough money and then I just needed to find the right strategy because I used to just swing trade for several years buy mm -hmm. the dip, sell the rip. Right. I did that uh, pretty successfully, but it was exhausting. And then sometimes I would find myself holding trades for a longer period of time than I anticipated because it turned out that I'm not that good at picking the bottom. But I'm just willing to hear to admit it to you guys. That's why I sell puts because it's like a handicap if you will, <laughs> like it's a, it's a way to get paid a little bit of money up front to buy a stock that you want to own anyway at a discount. And that's how it, it kind of happened for me. And it just morphed guys. And now, uh, man, it's a great living. It's a lucrative living, but I stick to my strategy and I do it all when the numbers aren't moving. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is exactly how much money I want to make on this stock. And I'm hoping to do it over the course of three to five years and come hell or high water, I'm going to stick to that strategy and it's either going to work out or it isn't. But the minute you start deviating things as in life, same in the stock market, it tends not to work out in your favor once you start deviating from the initial plan when your emotions were initially in check. 
Yeah. Uh, two things. First of all, sorry for your loss. Man, I, I, I can't so imagine. But can you do it? Yeah. And um, secondly, now you said that to do what you're doing, you need to have at least six figures, right? Seven. To do it, yeah, or, or seven figures. Oh, okay. To do this like full time, right? Like the way you're doing with the amount of money that you're trading. In my opinions, it depends on your lifestyle, obviously, right? There's a lot of variables, but to to live the way that I was living in the oil field, I'd say a minimum of 500k. You can you can get it done because I was making about 100, 120 in the oil field. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more conservative with your trades, which is definitely the surefire way to go. I'm very aggressive in my strategy with the stocks that I trade. You've seen what I hold. You probably wouldn't buy half of those. In order to wheel the stocks that I'm willing to wheel, you need to have a lot of money because the swings are going to be very massive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's get let's get into it. You have a presentation here for us. So we're going to pull it up. But I do want to, the reason why I was asking about the six figures or seven figures, because um, I don't have that amount in, sure. in the market, right? So I'm right now, what I'm doing, I'm just playing with $5,000. It's small wins. That's what I've been telling people that yeah, it's you small can stack wins. Those up and eventually it'll really work out for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you, you, you compound that until you build up your account to the level where you can just put more risk on the table and be able to accumulate and. I guess, capture more money down the line. Because right now, for example, I did WBE, was it Monday? I did W, it was an easy $250. It took me like 24 hours or something. Like that. I got $250. I had two contracts done. Um, then I think my Apple is currently down, uh, but I did several. So I made about 500 bucks this week just off of that, just collecting premiums. So it was re- it was relatively easy. It's small money. It's not life-changing yeah, money, but you compound not to interject, Mark, but how are you able to sell puts on so, Apple if you don't have like a hundred if you don't have seventeen thousand bucks? No, I'm doing verticals. So I did a call, yeah, a call, a call vertical. So that's Barrett. So the, it's the the one where it's a vertical spread where you sell and buy a call, but is a is a bearish play. Okay. Where the put is a is like a bullish play. And essentially I set my my two levels that I want and I don't want um, Apple to get to that level. Usually it will bounce off in a cell. So I'm, I'm collecting the, the theta DK from that. So the okay. only, the only cash secure puts that I had this week was five, four calls, which I closed today for 26% profit off of those. I don't have any cover calls currently. I have an iron condor that I also closed this week on XOP. Um, I had the vertical, it was a vertical call spread on WWE. That's how I got that easy um, 250 because out of the blue, I knew that WWE wasn't going to go above 17 because I think they're going to get bought out for around $107 a share. So I knew it was going to kind of fluctuate and stay within there. So I did a 110 and 115 and um, it went to 107 and then literally just like in one day, it sold off like 7%. In a and single the day, WWE, that was to play with the UFC, right? Is that the yeah? They, they merged, yeah. I mean, they, they merged, but that was like a couple a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So, um, when that happened, I did a call, there's a regular call option play. So, yeah. I do everything from like the verticals because I don't have a large account, so I can't do cash secure puts on Apple or um, yeah, it takes a lot of money. yeah or a cover, yeah, exactly. So, I, I can't do that. When my friend who has a fifty thousand dollar account, he does Apple. All day long. He does Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Those are the ones that he does nonstop, and he's been killing it with it. I'm the one who taught him and showed him how to do that. So since I have a smaller account because I have less risk and I don't have the time, I just pretty much do the verticals. And then occasionally I do the cash secure puts. And I spoke about that before. That Ford is to me, Ford is one of the easiest ones to start off with because it's kind of predictable. And it's pretty stable considering the space that it's in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's what I did. Um, So, all right. Yeah. So let's show up your presentation. There you go. Go for it. Awesome. So if I click on this little guy right here. So anyway, this is uh, something that I created, guys, because I went live on my channel uh, a couple of months ago because I have like 20 viewers that watch me on a daily basis. And they're like, hey, can you put something together for us? It just kind of goes through the wheel strategy in its entirety from my vantage point. Are you guys able to see slide one and whatnot? Because I went full screen on mine. Um, We see just the first slide. Okay, yeah. super. So this is a sell put, sell cost, collect premium. That is my mantra. That's what I do here on the channel. There's a lot of methodologies that you can utilize. You can you can you can buy you can buy calls, buy puts. You can sell calls, sell puts. Everything else is going to be derivative of those things. I look at it like being an insurance agency or being a casino. 
I could either be the one paying premium or receiving premium. So I choose to be the casino or the insurance agency. That's why I strictly only sell puts and calls for a living, otherwise known as the wheel strategy. So the objective, guys, here is to wheel stocks that we want to own for three to five years. So a lot of people want to get into this thing, but they miss out on the very first part. I'm only wheeling stocks that I want to own for three to five years. And they need to pay adequate premiums and have a realistic chance of doubling in stock price during our time frame. And that is why I choose the stocks that I choose to wheel. So my strategy specifically is to accomplish certain goals. And I'm going to lay them out for you guys as we get through this thing real quickly on my background. And I'm going to I'll make this available, Mark. So they want to if they want to get with it. I'll send them a link that way I can kind of breeze through these and y'all can ask me the the critical okay. questions, because I'm sure you're dying to ask me why I wheel the stocks that I wheel. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, wheel deals background, guys. What inspired me to be the wheel deal? It was a Robert Robert Kiyosaki. I was at a at a conference in Dallas, Texas, several years ago, and I attended a seminar, and I was exposed to this cash flow quadrant, and it was a major eye opener for me. There was employees on one side, self-employed, and then you had business centers and investors on the other side. So right away, I saw that being an investor was the quadrant that provided the most time and money for my life. Now, I wasn't able to jump in right away into that quadrant, though. I had to pay the price working various jobs and lots of failing forward, if you will. But here, you know, this is where we're at right now. So now I'm a full-time investor, and I'm on a mission to share everything I've learned about the wheel strategy over the last couple of years. And that's... Uh, that's how that happened in a nutshell, guys. Now, what is the, the wheel strategy from my vantage point? Is one, you pick a stock that you want to own. You pick a strike price, a price that you're comfortable owning it for at least three to five years. Then you sell a put, you're going to collect premiums. You're going to do that over and over again until you get assigned. Whenever that happens, you're going to sell a covered call. You're going to collect more premiums. Then you're going to do that over and over again until you get assigned. You have the shares called away, and then you're going to rinse and repeat. And ultimately, the goal is to lower your adjusted cost basis to zero. So I want to emphasize that point real, real quickly before we keep going forward. I wheel the same stocks over and over again because the whole purpose of my methodology is I want to own those shares outright with other people's money. It's a think and grow rich strategy from Napoleon Hill. The wealthy, successful people use other people's money, other people's efforts, other people's ideas. And they're real, real leery when it comes to other people's opinions, because people have the tendency to kind of piss in your ear and, you know, kind of steal your dreams. So you have to be careful with that. So that's why I stick to the same handful of stocks. And when I lower my adjusted cost basis to zero on that stock, that is when I can take on another uh, stock into my portfolio. It's only whenever that occurs that I'm willing to bring on another uh, stock into the into the matrix, if you will. So I don't suffer from the shiny object syndrome. I think the shiny object syndrome is the number one reason people go broke, not just wheeling, but just trading in general, because they're always looking for the next big thing. And there's only so many Googles out there, guys. I can promise you I've been in this game for over 25 years. But a cash care put, guys, a cash care put involves writing an at the money or out of the money put option and simultaneously setting aside enough cash to buy the stock. The goal is to be assigned and acquire the stock below today's market price. Whether or not the put is assigned, all outcomes are presumably acceptable. And step two is you just rinse and repeat until you're assigned. You're literally selling puts on the same stocks over and over again until you're assigned, guys. You will have to adjust your strike prices and expiration dates according to the current market conditions. I like to sell puts 30 to 45 days out and stay between 15 and 40 deltas or 0.15 and 0.4 deltas. If you want to get technical. I like to pick strike prices that are above major moving averages, such as the 50 and the 200 day averages. Often I'm unable to do so because the premiums aren't sufficient for my strategy. So I have to be willing to take a calculated risk when selling puts. I'm shooting for 30 to 40 percent annualized cash on cash returns when selling cash secured puts. So because that is what I'm shooting for, AT&T, probably not a stock that I'm ever going to wheel. Is it a great stock to wheel? It is for a lot of people, but it isn't for me. It's not. It just doesn't make it just doesn't work out for my particular goals, but you have to find whatever works for you. So now whenever you ultimately get assigned, you're going to have to sell covered calls. A covered call involves a seller offering 
buyers a call option at a set price and expiration date on a security that the seller owns. You must own at least 100 shares of the underlying security in order to sell a covered call. So as you guys can see right away that this is a very capital intensive strategy because we're talking about Tesla that's, you know, that's $17,000 worth of, worth of stocks, worth, worth of shares. So you're, you know, that's more than some people's portfolio. So you have to pick stocks that work for your particular budget, guys. Now you're going to rinse and repeat until the shares are called away. You will literally sell cover calls over and over again on the same stocks until your shares are called away. You want to pick a strike price that you are absolutely okay selling your shares in case if you aren't able to roll out of the position. Now, this is the key, guys. This is what makes me the real deal. And I apologize that this slide's very uh, tough to read, so I'm going to read most of it for you. And it's rolling right until you're right, guys, because if you just want to sell puts, collect premium, sell calls, collect premium, you're going to do okay. But until you master the art of rolling right until you're right, you're not going to make the kind of returns that the wheel deal has been making for the last three years wheeling full time. So this is according to Robin Hood, guys. Rolling means closing an options position and simultaneously only opening a new position, typically with an expiration further out in time and sometimes using a different strike price. It's called rolling because the act of closing one position and opening a new one is sent to the market as one order and executed at a single net price. There are a number of reasons you might want to choose to roll an options position, but typically the goal is to extend duration. Extending duration allows you to close a position prior to expiration while establishing a similar position further out in time. Keep in mind, though, rolling involves closing an existing position and realizing gains or losses while also opening a new position. Rolling options doesn't ensure profit or guarantee against the loss. You may also end up compounding your losses. By rolling out, the duration is extended, which can also increase risks, and there's more time for the underlying securities price to move unfavorably. Note, you cannot roll options if you have a cash account on Robinhood. That's something that I learned the hard way early on. What are the different ways to roll, guys? You can roll out, you can roll up, you can roll down, you can roll up, down, and out. Why do traders roll options? Many option strategies require active management, and unlike stocks, options expire. You can't hold on to them forever. When an option reaches expiration, it will either expire worthless if it's out of the money or result in an obligation to buy or sell shares of the underlying security if it's in the money. Rolling your options prior to expiration helps to avoid those outcomes, among other reasons. Scenarios where you might consider rolling your options. We don't want to carry a position into expiration, but want to maintain a similar strategy to adjust your existing position or because your view of the underlying security has changed. And then I go into the Greeks, guys, and we don't have to talk about the Greeks. I know that y'all have already covered those on your channel. The main Greeks that you will uh, encounter whenever you're selling puts and calls is you got to get very familiar with time decay and delta. Those are those are your babies. And then the gamma is just the accelerator to the delta. There's uh, several channels and several people that talk about the Greeks. They've forgotten more about the Greeks than I ever care to learn. But I uh, I stick to the cover on the cash care pit sides. I'm very conservative between 1.5 and as high as 0.4 on covered calls. I'm very, very conservative. I like to stick to 0.15 and 0.25 deltas on the Greeks. That's the most important Greek for selling cash secure puts and cover calls. Now, the other one that I'm going to bounce to real quickly is slide 14. It's position sizing, guys. This is just something that I came up with at three o'clock in the morning one day, and I have stuck to it and it's really, really worked out for me. These are, uh, it's a 25, 25, 50 strategy. These are my position sizing strategies that I've heard work well for me over the years. I look at them like three bullets. My first bullet will be 25% of the total position allocation and so on and so forth. I'm not a conventional investor, guys. I cannot stress that enough. When a stock goes down in price, I actually look to accumulate more shares, provided the investment thesis hasn't changed. Some would say it's like catching a falling knife. I call it taking advantage of a sale when your favorite stock is trading at a discount. This strategy is not for everyone, though. You need to have the stomach to double down when the stock price is moving against you. I'm going to read that again. You need to have the stomach to double down when the strike price, when the stock price 
is going against you. Bankroll required, guys, a lot of people don't talk about this enough, but in my opinion, from my experience, you need to have at least enough to own 500 shares of the underlying. If you don't have enough in your bankroll to own at least 500 shares of Tesla, you probably shouldn't be wheeling one contract of Tesla, in my opinion. Trading the wheel strategy the way that I do requires quite a bit of capital. Since I ultimately like to use a covered combination strategy, I often have multiple put, puts and calls on the same stock simultaneously. If the underlying is trading at 10 bucks a share, you need at least $5,000 in my honest opinion to successfully wheel that stock. $10 would be, or $10,000 would be more ideal, but you can make it work with just 5,000, but you better be on your P's and Q's for sure. Cause the minute these trades go against you, you can find yourself bag holding these shares for a lot longer than three to five years, or at some point you have to be willing to cut your losses. And I've definitely had to cut my losses on a handful of stocks over the year, guys. Now only wheel high conviction stocks. This is probably my most important slide guys. All of the problems that you will ever encounter if you want to trade the wheel strategy, even just as a side hustle or full time, the way that I do for a living, all of your problems can be avoided if you would only wheel high conviction stocks. So only wheel stocks that you are literally okay owning for three to five years. Why? Because sometimes it takes that long to lower your adjusted cost basis to zero dollars. A share of the ultimate goal is to own the shares with other people's money, guys, OPM. And again, guys, it's not financial advice. Normally, I'm supposed to lead out with this one, but somehow mm -hmm. it made it to slide 17. But let's just go ahead and get into it to cover our bases. We live in a world where very few people want to assume responsibility for their own actions. I am not a financial advisor. You need to take responsibility for your own investment choices. I live with my results, and you have to live with yours as well. Uh, slide 18 is sell put, sell cost, collect premium. Keep it simple, guys, and you can't, you guys can succeed. All I do is sell puts and calls on the same stocks over and over again until I lower my adjusted cost basis to zero. And I call that manufacture the win. Peace out and God bless you guys. And that is my contact info, TJ the wheel deal at gmail.com. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much. So, so that just is pretty. Pretty straightforward running through it because y'all can find that information and read it on your own. I want to engage in a conversation with you guys, Mark, because I followed your channel enough to know that everything that I do is not what you would do. <laughs> so no, no, I, want <laughs> to, I want to give you a chance to put me on the cross, brother, because I am here to defend my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Listen, first of all, I wouldn't have invited you on here if I didn't if I didn't like you. But um, Mo, so Mo is not familiar with he doesn't really do this, right, Mo? So for an individual who doesn't know a lot about like the cash secure puts, wheel strategy, cover calls, Mo, do you have any questions for him that? that so you may I would say to ask you. You've been doing this for twenty five years, and twenty twenty for people like me that were buying or uh, buying calls worked perfect. You would buy calls, close your eyes, go to the washroom, take your hundred percent, go home. Easy. Everybody was an expert in 2020. Yeah. 2021, people realized, you know, the market could go up and down. And 2022, everyone got wiped out. And 2023, more people are getting wiped out. So from your point of view, your strategy, is it consistent every single year based on the market? Not based on what you're doing. I'm pretty sure you're adjusting it. But I mean, like, pretend that it's not you doing your strategy, a normal person doing a real strategy. Is it consistent in terms of, uh, the ease of how many uh, micromanagement decisions you have to make. Like, um, do you just plug and play every year or is it different now or is it harder now? Definitely 2020 was obviously pretty easy, guys. My portfolio was up 324%. So, uh, but it's because I was better in 2020. No, it's because of the market conditions, right? Yeah. So the market conditions were favorable. I mean, you could uh, buy a company like, Nicola that rolled the, an 18 wheeler down the hill and make money, right? That thing went up to like 70 or $80 and the guy flat out lied to everybody. Uh, now you have to adjust guys. You have to adjust. So volatility, the vol the VIX, the volatility index, the higher it is, the more premiums, right? So the juice is worth the squeeze, but yeah. you have to be careful. You have to be careful because some stocks are going to move with the market 
And then some people, some stocks are going to either outperform or underperform the market, right? Like you have Tesla. Tesla is a little bit of an outlier. It it ticks to its own drum. It like the market could be totally red, and then Tesla's up ten or twenty percent because. Elon tweeted something. So you have to be really, really careful. But no, I've definitely had to adjust. And 2020 was good. Most of 21 was uh, good also, uh, Mo. But then uh, the growth stock started getting hammered. If you look at where the Russell yeah. has been performing, guys, the Russell has been getting its butt kicked for a solid two years now. So the premium has been really, really good. But you have to have a knack for picking a company, even though they're not profitable yet, that they have a legit chance for a path to profitability. If not, these dang things are going to go under. And it has happened to me. So I, I will tell you guys uh, a couple of them that really went against me bad. I'm talking about six figure losses, Ideonomics, IDEX. And I know several people that work there. Yeah, I that yeah, there, and I feel yeah. deceived as an investor because they just didn't deliver on a lot of the things that I bought into. Mm -hmm. And another company that cost me dearly was a company called Paysafe. And this was in 20 late 21. I uh, did tax harvest losses on both of those in uh, 2022 for 2022. So IDEX, I remember there was a big scam on Twitter where this person was, um, selling the they were he was offloading it but he was telling people he was buying it and then they deleted it and they were pretty high up with the ceos and stuff so i know then it became a meme stock i knew like there was a whole uh thing going on on twitter where they were just uh trying to gamma squeeze it so i know exactly what you're talking about yeah, yeah. so the thing is is the company because you gotta and y'all have all heard this there's the company and then there's the stock yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea, the idea of ideonomics is actually really clever. They want to be like a one-stop shop. Like I'm a big SoFi bull. It's like trying to be a one-stop shop for finance, but you got to consider they're competing against the big boys and the big boys control the narrative. So SoFi, that's an uphill battle. It's like trying to form the XFL for like the fourth time now you're going up against the NFL. Chances are you're probably, you'll be lucky to still have airtime. You're not going to get the millions and millions of views and you're not going to get the billions of dollars in contracts. So I think SoFi is going to have a niche, but it's not going to be the NFL in my opinion, because the big banks will never let it be. And Ideonomics has this idea to be this one-stop shop for all things EV. I thought it was great, but they diluted the living daylights out of that stock. And there's, they, they need funding, guys. If they don't have any funding, they'll be filing for Chapter 7, 11, 13, 15. They'll make up some numbers. <laughs> this is not going well. They didn't yeah. deliver. So I took an L. Or I'm I'm actually officially taking the biggest L of my career with Ideonomics, but it'll, it's going to be a tax harvest loss for 2023. I, I, I want to touch on Ideonomics because the minute you said IDEX, mm -hmm. it rang a bell. Okay. My lawn, my lawn guy, the guy who does my lawn, Okay. Back in 2021, I believe, he saw me through my window trading. And then him and I started having a discussion because that was a time, the six month period when I was just trading. I didn't have a job. I was just trading full time. And he asked me, he's like, hey, he's like, oh, you're, you're trading? I was like, yeah. He was like, I'm invested in some company called IDEX, Ideonomics, like you were right. saying. I was like, okay. He's like, do you mind taking a look at it? I was like, sure. So I went and I took a look at it and I was like, this is not a profitable company. At that time, it was close to $2, I think. He had bought, I think, at three dollars, and then also at two dollars. Mm -hmm. But he put his entire life savings oh, God. in that. And yeah. I remember when he said that, and I looked at, it, I was like, "Dude, I was like, I don't think this is a good idea. You might want to get out." And he's like, "No, man. He's like, he's like, it's gonna, it's gonna take off. I'm telling you. He's like, look at the chart long term." I was like, "Yeah, I see that. At one point, it was at four dollars, almost five dollars." But I was like, "Dude, it's been selling off nonstop." Uh, he's like, "I believe in this company. I just pulled up the chart. I didn't realize how far it dropped." I think it's like four or five cents. cents. I don't even look anymore. Yeah, it's 46 cents. It's down 98.16% in a past no, five years. it's 0. 0.46 cents. Yes, 40. Oh, yeah. You're right. Four cents. Jesus. Yeah, four yeah. cents. <laughs> Sorry. I just never I seen wish, I wish it was at 46 cents. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, I just never seen. Yeah, I never seen a company go down that, that, that low. But why? Why would you? So that's that's the one thing that you and I probably don't see eye to eye. Sure. I love your strategy. I love everything you're doing. But before I, I get into um, criticizing what you do, it's I want to talk about uh, the just to kind of dumb it down for for everybody. The basically what you're doing is you're doing cash secure puts. 
Correct. On companies you're willing to buy. The willing Once to you, willing yeah, to own. Yes, you're willing to own. Mm -hmm. So again, let's say, like I said, I like doing it with Ford because Ford is relatively cheap. So Ford is, I think, at eleven dollars. Let's say it's eleven dollars, and you I believe think, that I think Ford at ten bucks, bro, you're gonna sleep like this. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Ford is, is really easy, but just basically, yeah. let's say it's at eleven dollars. You do a cash secure put for ten dollars, mm -hmm. so you're collecting that premium. It may never hit ten dollars. So then you just collect that premium and you're good to go. But if it does hit that $10, it will execute. Now you own the shares, plus you keep the premium. And then you do a cover call in that, usually out of the money or at the money. And that's what creates the will strategy, correct? Correct. So essentially, yeah. it's like a rental. Like 100 shares is like a little virtual rental because a lot of people can relate to real estate. If somebody invests in real estate, you're going to buy a house and if you're buying rental properties. It stands to reason that you want to put a tenant in there. You want to put a renter in there. Correct. So when I have a hundred shares of a stock that I either buy out, right? Cause I do a lot of buy, right? Mm -hmm. Like I buy and then I write a cover call. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Or if I get assigned via cash secured put, because I'm not as bullish on mm -hmm. that particular company at that particular time. And these shares get put on me because it's a cash secured put. So it's, it's like the money goes into escrow and then those shares are put into your account. They take the cash away in lieu of the shares and then you immediately have to turn around and sell a covered call so you can generate more premium. Because mm -hmm. the, the wheel strategy is coined as the triple income strategy. You get money going in, you get money coming out, and you get money from the difference of what you bought it for and what you sold it for. Yeah, because it always sounds so complicated. When, Ideally. When, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when people say, because I know like, Mo, you you sat through TJ and you sat through um, Suzanne and you sat through my stuff. Does it seem complicated to you? No, but I could tell you that TJ's skill is more than just wheel strategy. His skill is stock picking, which is what the key underlying thing here is. It's not so much wheel strategy. I think wheel strategy is just a system, but plugging right. in the stock is his, uh, his strength. And that's yeah. what I picked on. So that's what people need to realize. It's not just there's a system for wheel strategy where he does all the stuff and then you pick the right strike price option that's another skill but the main underlying skill here is picking the right stock like he mentioned the biggest l's he took was because he picked these stocks so that's his skill so he must be fundamentally very strong right that's the skill you need to know. Oh, guys, I don't ever talk about this, Mo, and I'm really glad that you mentioned it because I always like to tell people that none of this works if you don't pick the right underline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's, your, the whole, that's the whole part. For your situation. So you have to be a good picker. Uh, guys, I study these stocks for over a year. I'll paper trade them for over a year. I'll wheel them on paper for over a year before I ever sell my first put. So whenever I introduce the world to Riot and Marathon, because these things have made me an absorbent amount of money, I I have invested so much time studying them, but I also had to sell myself on this notion of Bitcoin because Bitcoin's tough. Like, first of all, let's talk about who Satoshi is. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, you can't answer that. You don't know that much about Bitcoin either. Shut up. Like, yeah. I mean, I just think that uh, the blockchain's a legit thing, but there's no intrinsic value in Bitcoin. And then these Bitcoin miners can mine a coin for, you know, twelve to fifteen thousand dollars, and Bitcoin is trading at twenty or thirty thousand dollars, I see how they make money without having to understand Bitcoin. But I'm still very Warren Buffett from the standpoint of I like to invest in things that I can wrap my mind around a little bit. But the thing also, aside from being a decent stock picker, Mo, the thing that sets me apart is my risk tolerance. Yes, you have I don't freak high. out. I don't freak out whenever shares go against me, dude. Like I mean, I'm in really, really heavy on SoFi. And if SoFi dips to four bucks, I'm going to load up even more because I'm manufacturing the win because I own a lot of SoFi, but I'm also collecting premiums over and over again, lowering my cost bases and mitigating and managing my risk. That way I'm not just sitting idle holding a bag. Like I'm actively trying to lower my adjusted cost basis to zero and I got a ways to go. My adjusted cost basis on SoFi is 557 across the board. So I'm getting close to where I can not sleep like this, but I'm not fidgeting as much. You know what I mean? But if I keep wheeling SoFi, if SoFi stays in the game, they keep, you know, outperforming their little earnings. Because I think uh, Noto does a great job of sandbagging earnings. Uh, the earnings. 
that's why they keep doing pretty well as far as earnings. But the market's not going to reward anything right now unless you're gap profitable. That's why Palantir, I, I know I've heard you talk about Palantir and you have your own issues. But the reason they're getting rewarded right now is because at some point it's hard to argue with accounting. At yeah. some point, it's hard to argue with almost $3 billion in cash and zero debt and contract, not for days, but for years. So there's something there. And then they're in this this hot bubble AI. I mean, anything with AI, and you're automatically getting rewarded 10% premium in the market right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I got to pick the right strikes and I got to be willing to see the strategy through because Tesla is probably the one that's made me the most uh, over the course of my career. But it's also cost me the most stress. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because <laughs> first of all, I mean, how do you value a company like Tesla? I think it's a car company with a twist, but I'm not banking on robo taxis. I'm not banking on any of that stuff. Like, show me a balance sheet that doesn't tell me that about 85 to 88 percent of their yeah. revenue comes from selling cars. And then I will tell you that Tesla is not just a car company. Right now, that's it's a car that's company how I feel. lighting and other stuff. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I'm not an expert in reading balance sheets, but I'm not dumb either. I know this. They make the vast majority of their income from selling cars. Mm -hmm. So if that is in a car company, I don't know what is. Do they do other things? that Do they have potentially other verticals? Absolutely they do. But it's it, it hasn't been proven yet. It hasn't been proven yet. We don't know if, if these mega packs are going to be the real deal. We don't know if solar is going to be the real deal. We don't, we don't know. I mean, we don't know if, uh, what, what was it called? Optimus or whatever, the, the big old robot that they're promoting now. Yeah. We don't know if that's going to be the real deal. We don't know if these verticals are actually going to do anything. So for right now, Tesla is a car company that has some pretty sexy margins. Yeah. So my, my question for you, though, is this, too, when it comes to so you and I, we do the same thing similar. Right. Right now, I do like when it comes to day trading, I do the verticals for the most part, but I also do cash secure puts and cover calls. We talked about that. Right. Um, I just I, I like the premiums I get from the verticals, but it's a little bit riskier. That's why I always like to suggest people should learn cash secure puts and um, cover calls first with stocks that are usually around ten dollars or below or, or under twenty dollars, depending on what your budget is. Right. Like you said, you are a more high risk trader than I am in my personal opinion. And the stocks that you pick, and that's where, where you like tear me apart. Cause like you pick, you pick very high volatile stocks that are usually not profitable that are growth stocks, right? Why would you do that instead of going for the more blue chip safe ones that you know are not going to go anywhere? Cause like so far, with especially everything that's going on with the banks. So okay. if I could be the next one that could collapse. Um, Palantir, half the people don't even know what the software really does for the government. Then, you know, you have Riot, I think was the other one you said, which is that follows Bitcoin. For my right top now. five holdings in my YouTube portfolio mm -hmm. is uh, is Riot, Marathon, SoFi, Tesla, and Neo. So the only company that are legit, that's legit profitable there in that scenario is SoFi. And then my sixth top holding is Palantir. So I only have two companies that are like, like you know, like, not profitable. Yeah. But but why would you why would you go with the growth stocks and the more risky ones instead of the blue chips? That's a really really good question. It's because I'm looking for a for a stock that, in my opinion, based on where it's trading at today, has a reasonable opportunity in my mind to double in share price in that three to five year time period. I love Apple. Apple is not going to double in price, in my opinion, in three to five years. And I will Apple in the larger portfolios. So mm -hmm. I don't want to act like I don't. So I don't want people to think that this is the only thing that I wheel. This is what I wheel on my channel because it's it's a it's a smaller portfolio. We're only working with three hundred thousand bucks in this particular portfolio. So I'm on a mission to see how long is it going to take me to take that that uh, portfolio from. 245,000 is what we started at. We're at about 300,000 now. If you look at whatever Robin it says the account value is, and you see that I show my portfolio all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just trying to see how long it's going to take to get to a million. So if I'm going to wheel Walmart, if I'm going to wheel Costco, you know, stuff that's tried and true, if you will, I don't even know if YouTube's going to be around by the, by the time I get there. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to, to create a channel that could be kind of exciting, trading a very quote unquote boring strategy because the wheel strategy is meant to be very, very boring. It's systematic. It's repeatable. It's consistent if done right. 
So mm-hmm. I was like, what could I do to make it a little bit more entertaining and exciting with uh, what most people would consider quite a bit of money? Very quote unquote risky. But in my mind, I'm like, this is like this is the fun stuff anyway for me, because I'm a big fan of buy, holding and hoping, putting into the, the SPY, the QQQ. I like to sleep, too. Yeah. I, like, I like to sleep, too, guys. I mean, make no mistake about it. But uh, I need a I need a company that's going to pay me adequate premium or a stock that's going to pay adequate premium, just like I said in those slides, and that I believe is going to double in share price from where it is today. That's why I, I have a thing right now where I'm comparing Tesla to Neo. I like to, I like Neo at eight bucks versus Tesla at one sixty, because I think Neo has a chance to go from eight to sixteen a lot faster than Tesla is going to go from one sixty to three twenty. My argument is not that I think that Neo is a better company. I just think that it's easier for me to double my money in Neo at these prices because they have enough money in the bank. They have backing from the Chinese government. I'm a fan of battery as a service because. The degradation of the battery is on Neo. It's not as you, on you as a consumer. So I look at different angles versus we're just going to sit here and have a debate on whether or not Tesla is a better company than Neo. I'm not going to partake in a debate that I've already lost because you'd have to be an idiot to think that Neo is a better company. I mean, we can argue about Elon's politics and everything else, but Tesla is a freaking beast, whether it's worth Five trillion dollars or whatever Kathy Wood thinks that it's going to be—that's a conversation for another channel. I have no idea. I have no. I, I still think it's this car company. So a lot of people hate me for that. Yeah. And do you for uh, for people who have like a, a smaller account, right? For first of all, I would like to also mention that anybody who wants to start this type of strategy to begin with, again, cover calls you require to actually own hundred shares before you're even able to do that, right? You have As to, for yeah. As for cash secure puts. Your account has to be at least over 5,000. I did realize that because you have to be on margin for both of them. And that kind of sucks. I haven't found any other strategy where you could just do cash, have a cash account. You have to have margin. So what I also noticed, which is a trick, I don't know if it's just with E-Trade or Thinkorswim. I don't know. You said you do it on Robinhood and, and other banks as well. We and we yeah. Mm-hmm. I noticed that when you do cash secure puts, although you need over $5,000 to do cash secure put, they don't collect the entire like cost of 100 shares they only do around 30 percent and if you don't pay attention you can actually go heavy into margin not realizing that they haven't taken away the other 70 percent that it was supposed to be withheld for the cash secure put if that makes sense so if you look at if you click on an underline and we can actually i'm not going to open up my robin if you want me to and show you like it actually tells you what the margin maintenance requirements are for those stocks if you scroll all the way to the bottom like oh, okay. Tesla is like a 50, 45 stock. Oh, okay. so, so you can actually wield Tesla on margin by only having 50% of that buying power. Oh, interesting. Okay. I didn't but know that. Here, but here's where Robinhood and Webull and any, and any brokerage can, can put it on you. They reserve the right at any time to change those margin requirements and put you into a margin maintenance or margin call situation. And that's happened to me a handful of times. In fact, I did a video on my channel a couple months ago because I woke up. They had changed the margin requirements. I was real heavy on SoFi and Tesla on puts. So I had to liquidate some positions or move money around or I had to inject cash because I was in a tough spot because I don't make the policies. I don't make the rules. You have to play within the confines. So you have to be real careful, man. So I always tell people don't trade on margin or anything of the sort unless you're in a position where you can inject the cash. But you'd rather have the cash in your checking account versus giving a bunch of money like to Robinhood because it's scary, right? Like we don't know, like Robinhood is very immature as well. It's not mm-hmm. It's not Charles Schwab, you know what I mean? So, so you have to be careful where you put your money. And I don't know if they have the $2 million insurance the way that SoFi is lined up with a bunch of banks now because the FDIC is 250, 250K. And now somehow they partnered up with other banks. I don't know how they did it, but SoFi is touting that they'll give you $2 million of insurance now. Mm. And I don't know if uh, I don't know if Robinhood has done the same or not. That's definitely something that I'll ask because I'm on the, on the horn with Robinhood frequently because I have a lot of money in Robinhood and it's to the point where I'm getting uncomfortable and I'm in the process of talking with other brokerages that can house all the money because there's a lot of uh, regulations with how much money you can have if it's not a, like in a, in an IRA or a 401k. 
as far as what they'll ensure, you know, if somebody were to hack your account or whatever, it could get very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, Mo, do you have anything? No, I think uh, I think it's a very interesting strategy, but there's multiple layers to it. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to understand. I think I have a good idea. Yeah. And could you, since you're here, what would be a recommendation for you for somebody who, let's say, has only $10,000 to play with? Like, how would you recommend they get into this space of doing the will strategy? What's can I advice? can I can I walk them through an example on my Robinhood portfolio? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. That way we can. Uh... So here's a little. Are you guys able to see that or no? Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. There no. you go. All right. Okay. Awesome. So 10K, right? Correct. Okay. Awesome. So these are the stocks that I'm wheeling on the top, on the top, you guys see all the options, right? So I have the 40 cover calls on Neo that y'all see all that, the put, yeah. mm -hmm. so et cetera. So you got to find a stock that you really, really believe in. And it has to obviously be, uh, you said 10,000 bucks, right? Yeah. About $10,000. I guess. Okay, so you could technically wheel one $100 stock, or you can do what I would do is I would look between the 10 and $20 range personally and what i would look at in my portfolio is the company that is the quote unquote cheapest and whether you agree with what they do or not because i had my son research palantir man he found a lot of stuff that i didn't agree with specifically doing some contracts for ice and it was real tough because of my heritage and where i come from <laughs> but yep. uh, palantir is a very profitable company and they have about you know almost three billion dollars in the bank and they don't own anybody any money so i would look at a cast of care put on palantir i'd be very very comfortable owning palantir at i have it there y'all see it right 2500 shares at 757 but i don't control the market conditions so if i was establishing a position in palantir right now i would look in the ten dollar range so i would go to trade palantir options i go on sell and put and I would do something 30 to 45 days out. So I would do maybe June 30th. And I'd look at, uh, I'd look at like 10 bucks with the understanding that if, this, if the trade goes against me, I would actually try to roll down and actually take possession of these shares at nine bucks. So at 10 bucks, it would just be a cash grab. I essentially want to tie up a thousand dollars on cash secure put. You're going to pay me 2.4% right now, which is 24 bucks. And that's the trade that I would enter into. And it'd hit continue and and I'd probably I'd scale into it. If you're just barely getting started, I'd probably do anywhere from one to one to five contracts. I'd hit review order. So it's basically telling you right there you're agreeing to buy five hundred shares of Palantir at ten bucks on or before June the thirtieth. If you aren't asked to buy Palantir by then, you'll keep your collateral on the full one hundred and twenty dollars in credit. So that's uh that's one trade that I would do. The other one that I would look at would be uh because I know that Marathon kind of got its butt kicked a little bit. This is one of the Bitcoin miners on uh, Marathon. And you're going to see that this one pays a lot more premium. I'm telling you that a real good entry point on Marathon will be about $7.50. So I would look again at 42 days out. And I would look at $7.50. And you're going to see how sexy that is. And I would, again, just scale in if you're just starting out. Let's just do, let's just do 10 contracts for easy math, right? So that would be... So you're tying up uh, in this in this instance would be uh, seventy, yeah, seven fifty times ten, so seventy five hundred bucks. So I definitely wouldn't recommend ten contracts, but we can do something with five. I don't know if I can go back here. So you go five contracts. You're going to buy five hundred shares of Marathon at seven fifty on or before June the thirtieth. If you aren't asked to buy Marathon by then, you'll keep your collateral on the full two hundred and seventy five dollars in credit. And I'm here to tell you that that's an easy cash grab, guys. I don't think or I don't think that Marathon is going to go back down to seven dollars and fifty cents. And I look at it this way. Let me see where I can get her to where I can see you guys. I want you to understand the power of the wheel strategy and selling a cash secure put. I'm going to put it to you this way. This is the way that it was put to me by my mentor. I want you to go take $3,750 to your bank. And I want you to withdraw 
$275 and in 42 days, go back to your bank and be like, hey, I want my $3,750. They're going to tell you that you're crazy and they're going to escort you out to, with security. It's a lot of money. I mean, the return is kind of crazy because because you, you need marathon to dip. What is that math wise? It's at nine and some change. What what is it? Because I'm not I'm nine not nine eighteen. So it's nine eighteen, and you needed to go. You needed to go down. What about twenty percent or so? Ten to fifteen percent. So you they're paying you two hundred and seventy five dollars right now. If you're if you're a marathon bull, keep in mind. The one thing that you can't copy in the stock market is conviction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. One thing that you cannot copy in the stock market is conviction. My conviction on SoFi will never be your conviction on SoFi. Right. My conviction on, on Palantir, and I don't have that much, but I'm seeing I do have some because it's relatively small in my portfolio for a reason. Because mm -hmm. I just, it's not a Palantir thing. It's, I don't know what Alex Carp I'm going to get. That's my issue with Palantir. I love a company that has $3 billion and doesn't have any money. It's hard to go out of business. Yeah. But I'm talking about like, I don't know what dude I'm going to get. If he's the philosopher, if he's going to tout the contracts, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to get. So I'm a little bit uneasy because I don't believe in him the way that I believe in Anthony Noto. And the reason that I'm so big on SoFi, Mark, is because I've done a lot of research and homework on Anthony Noto. The dude's legit, in my opinion, right? So I happen to be one of those guys that puts my money where my mouth is. So uh, if you're a bull on one of these, like like Marathon, they're going to pay you 275 bucks up front to tie your money up for 42 days. And then if it dips, well, then you're getting it at a pretty substantial discount from today's prices. And then you're just going to turn around and sell covered costs. You know that it can go to 9 or 10 bucks. And you do that for another 45 days, pick up another 250 300 bucks and you're already in it for about $500 out of pocket and you only tied up 37.50 your adjusted cost base is 32.50 how would you like to own 100 you know uh 500 shares of marathon for $3250 out of pocket cuz that could be you in that situation and it's just a game of math to me but i have to be bullish on the company overall and for me overall is in 3 to 5 years I'm not real, real bullish on their fundamentals today, but I've done enough homework on the company to believe that they are they have a path to profitability. I think that they have finally gotten to the point because now they're selling most of the Bitcoin that they mine. They're not going to keep diluting the living daylights out of the poor investors because some of these growth companies, guys, they treat shareholders like piggy banks. They treat us like ATM machines. Uh, there's a, I don't like to give other, I don't want to do a shout out. There's a company out there or, or a, a channel out there that says uh, share dilution is the silent and killer for most investors yes. because most people don't even look at it. They don't even, they're like, what? I don't understand. And he gives this example of like, if you're going to go invest in a pizza company and everybody has eight slices and now all of a sudden there's 16 slices. Now all of a sudden there's 32 slices. Now all of a sudden there's 64 slices. They're diluting your ownership. Correct. So that is why I wasn't a big fan of Tesla until recently. Have you guys looked at the float on Tesla? I, I know that that you're. No, Mo does. I yeah. don't know if Mo is or not. I don't know enough about his background. But dude, these people have diluted the living crap out of investors. Mm -hmm. And Elon Musk has literally lied to investors on several occasions, saying that he's done selling shares and he keeps selling shares. Oh, like. If I, I personally don't follow fundamental, but there's so much stuff that Elon said, like you said, even the meeting uh, or the interview had uh, the other day, it wasn't okay. a good interview. Yeah, it wasn't a good interview. The stuff he was saying wasn't really positive. But again, Tesla shareholders, they are emotional and they buy on emotion. Um, well, me and Mark have a price target for Tesla and it's $60. People think we're crazy, but we said it'll dip down to 150 when it was 500. It's again, it's my conviction is not your conviction. Right. I see what people assume that meanwhile, Tesla is doing all this shit, Porsche, Mercedes, BMW, they're just sitting on their hands. They're like, okay, we'll just let Tesla do whatever they're doing. My dad has had three BMWs in the last 10 years and his fourth one will also be a BMW. He's not going to all, all of a sudden switch to Tesla. There's a huge market outside Tesla. And I feel like a lot of people don't see that. I'm not saying Tesla's a shitty company, but like you said, 
I booked a cyber truck four years ago or five years ago. <laughs> it's been a yeah. is, it, is it in your garage? Dude, <laughs> yeah. They haven't even sent a courtesy email that it will be delayed. There's just nothing. Yeah. I, I had the pleasure of driving an I-7 a couple of days ago. I made a little short short on my uh, on my little channel. What a beautiful car. Yeah. The craftsmanship, everything about this car is just absolutely amazing. Now, it only gives you 300 miles, where I think the Tesla, the Model S can give you up to 400. The Plaid may give you like 380 or so, depending on how much you hot rod it or this cheetah stance or whatever the hell they do. But... 123 grand for the i7. It was used. It had like 3,000 miles. It was a spoiled customer that just turned it in. The plaid's like 140. It looks like a teenager put it together. The inside is not spectacular on a Tesla. Mm -hmm. It's boring. It's vanilla, vanilla ice cream. Yeah. This BMW, guys, everything was just absolutely gorgeous. I would much rather own the i7 and even the EQS because I drove the EQS about yeah, six, really nice. seven months ago. Beautiful car on the inside. I'm not sold on the outside yet. Like, dude, we don't have to look like we're going to Mars. Like, make it look <laughs> like a regular S class. I'm a customer. I'm interested. I want my next car to be an electric vehicle. Uh, but, brother, Teslas are kind of ugly. <laughs> like, they're, I mean, they're ugly. I'm, I mean, you, you, just, lost, you just lost you just lost half the places. audience there. You, <laughs> <laughs> you just lost half the audience. No, I'm kidding. Did, I'm kidding. They're ugly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just I just man, I just think that you could do better than that. And I think a lot of people want the cyber truck because it's people are gonna look at you when you're driving because they can't believe that that thing's on the road. And I've actually seen one like traveling. These things are a lot larger than I thought that they were as well. They're yeah. they're huge. You know, they're huge. But anyway, do you have any other questions? Uh, I My strategy is not for everyone. The wheel strategy, I think, is for everyone. The way that I yeah, wheel this way, because I do what's called the covered combination, right? I sell puts and I sell calls, same expiration dates, because I'm beating the crap out of these stocks, man. Like, I'm trying to beat them down, trying to collect enough premium so that the shares that I'm, quote, unquote, bag holding – I eventually have collected more premiums than I have paid for those shares so that I can manufacture the win and sleep easy at night. Yeah. No, but I, it's I, hard I, to I do that, have... Mark. It's hard to do that on Ford because if we pull up Ford, because I've wheeled Ford too. I've wheeled it on my yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, the Ford. premiums, the premiums are low. The premiums are relatively but, low. It's like if we do like I think that right. 11, because Ford doesn't move as much, right? So we don't have to go right. as far out of the money. So we, yeah, if you do, we do 11, 11 like a month from now, it's probably like so. Good. We'll do the same thing 42 days. I like to compare apples to apples, right? So we'll go 42 days, and I think 11 is reasonable for Ford. You're tying up $1,100 to get 24 on Marathon. I'm tying up 750 to get whatever it was, right? Like, right, I, yeah. we'll look, we'll look again. the only reason I'm recommending Ford because it's it's a lot, it's very safe and barely moves. It, That's the reason, it, you know. I am I'm a fan. I'm a I'm a fan of Ford. It just doesn't it just right now it doesn't meet my criteria for what I'm trying for what I'm trying to do in my account. But I mean if you're looking for again an easy stock, so you're gonna tie up 750 bucks to make 55. So it takes less capital to make a lot more money. And that's why that's why I like Marathon specifically. But uh yeah. It's okay. just you gotta you gotta do what works for you, man. But Ford, Ford's not gonna go out of business, and even if they go on the verge, they're gonna get another bailout, right? Because they Correct. they received a bailout <laughs> when Obama was president, right? I mean, yeah. it's 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 all good. It's all good. I mean, Henry Ford invented the the uh, the assembly line, so I'm a fan. You know, I'm a fan. I saw Ford uh, versus Ferrari. I'm a fan, guys. Yeah, it's that's a good just, movie. It doesn't give you. The premium, but that being said, the reason that it doesn't give you the premiums that a marathon will give you is because Ford's not gonna, it's not gonna go out of business. Yeah, it's not volatile. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it is volatile a little bit, but it's not gonna go out of business. Like the 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 chances of Ford going under are probably less than two or three percent. Mm -hmm. The 
chances of Marathon going out of business or, or Congress passing some sort of regulation for Bitcoin are probably, I mean, truth be told, it's probably a 50-50 proposition still. Yeah. So because it's a coin flip, the, the, the risk has to be commensurate with the reward. Yeah, absolutely. And vice versa. Dude, yeah, I definitely listen, man. I appreciate you coming on. I need to bring you on my show too, so we can have like a really, really long conversation because I think we have a lot to discuss, and I, I really appreciate it. Mo, do you have any other questions for oh, okay. Jay? Real, no, real, real quickly, Mo, tell me a little bit about your background, my man, because I because I saw you on his channel a few times. Do you do day trading? Is that what you do? Or yeah. What so I strictly do um, buying and selling calls and puts. Okay, I'm, so you're on. So you're on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. But I uh, but I do see why you guys do what you do, yeah, uh, because you don't have to be that accurate, and Theta is not coming after you, so you're not fighting uh, time as well. So I, we're fi we're fighting a lot of forces. So it's risk reward. I think it's better to know everything and then just sort of kind of have more tools on the tool belt, which is like I'm very uh, happy that we're bringing more people that are doing different things because. I don't understand people just shit talking one strategy or the other. If there's different ways to make money, we should present it to our audience and then they pick, yo, this is my risk tolerance. I like what Mark is doing. I like what TJ is doing. I like, so you can't have someone who you could just force strategies on. So um, mine is a little bit different. Uh, I'm slowly looking at futures too. Um, I think it's good to know a little bit of everything and specialize in one thing so you understand what the other part's doing. Because when you're trading, uh, you could get a sense of what the other parties are doing, like selling premium. Like for the longest time in the last six months, I've seen that they've been actually selling calls. They've been selling puts. That's where the money actually has been coming. Yeah. Awesome. So if I could leave you out with one little thing, because uh, I used to do Will Deal seminars live. Mm -hmm. I used to I used to tell people like this because of my skill set or lack thereof, I used the leverage of a thousand dollars to try to make a steady one hundred over and over and over again by selling puts and calls. If I had a better skill set, I would be doing things like Mo and using my skill set and the leverage of only a hundred dollars trying to grab a thousand. Yes, but I'm That's limited cool. on my skill set. I recognize it. I own it. I accept that this is where I'm at because directionality is not my game. If I could just, I don't have to be right. You know, like marathon in that example, it can go to eight and I still win. But if I had bought a call on marathon or even if I bought a put, but it doesn't move fast enough. Cause it's like you said, there's other forces. The Greeks are all against you, right? Whenever you're, whenever you're the buyer and not the seller, mm -hmm. I mean, you can still be, you can be wrong directionally selling cash care puts and cover calls and still make your bag. So that's the reason that I feel like even though it's, it's risky based on the underlines that I choose to wheel mark, because I don't have to be directionally correct. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, a, it's enough of a buffer. And the fact that I can roll out of those contracts, we can do, we can do a whole segment on the reason that I made so much money is because I can get paid to change my mind. Yeah, that is true. But anyway, man, I appreciate you having me on, my man. Keep doing what you're doing. It has just been absolutely awesome to watch you. And I know it seems like you took a break. I don't know what happened, but you came back bigger, badder, and stronger, man. You're like the virus. You're like COVID. You <laughs> no, thank you, man. I appreciate it. So listen, everyone, you can follow TJ at TJ The Wheel Deal on YouTube. OK, so make sure you help this brother out. Let's get him to at least a thousand, preferably over a thousand subscribers so he can get monetized because you have enough hours, I'm sure, at this point. You just need to get that thousand. Correct. Yeah, I got over five thousand hours. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Come on, people. Help him out. He only needs 30 more, 30 more subscribers. Get him over to that thousand. Listen, TJ, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You were a great guest. Maybe we'll bring yeah. you on again sometime in the future. We could talk a little bit more about this because um, this pretty much concludes our our part where, where me and Mo are covering cast secure puts and cover calls. From there, we're going to move on to another segment. We're going to teach a little bit something else. Eventually, I'm going to cover the vertical spreads that I do as well, um, which I, I just I want to save that for later on, especially since it is a little bit more risky. So um, again, TJ, thank you so much. 
Uh, thank everybody, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you give a thumbs up and subscribe if you're brand new. And until next time, I see.